Hello, everyone, again. Welcome back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your break. Um, I'm just a little bit a little bit scattered here. I just found out a friend died, so just give me a couple of seconds to compose myself. We are going to hear um, right now from Amy or Ewing, who is going to be talking to us about building the kingdom of God with and among highly educated people. Amy is an international author, speaker, and theologian who addresses the deep questions of our day with meaningful answers found in the Christian faith. Amy holds a doctorate in theology from the University of Oxford, and over the last 20 years, she's given talks and answered questions on university campuses around the world. She's also addressed parliamentarians in the speakers rooms and chapel at the UK Parliament and staffers on Capitol Hill and at the West Wing of the White House. Amy is interested in the intersection of questions of meaning and faith with the marketplace, education, and policy making. As Amy is our, is our only speaker for this session, she's going to be speaking um, for 15 minutes, and then we're going to have 15 minutes where we're going to be able to ask her questions. And to be able to facilitate this easier, what we're going to do is as she's speaking, if you could please put your questions in the chat, and then we'll filter those through, and we'll only have time pr to probably ask um, three or four questions of Amy. So if you have a burning question you'd like to ask her, please put it in the chat. And, and we'll see how many we can get answered. So Amy, thank you very much. And the time is yours. Thank you. I'm sorry to hear about your friend, but thank you so much for, for having me and hello to everybody. Um, I've been listening in this morning, but also dealing with children and lots of lots of different things going on. So um, it's great to be with you all and um, to have just a, a few moments together to focus on this question of building the kingdom of God with and amongst highly, highly educated people. Um, and um, just a, a little bit more of my own background. So um, I've worked for the last 23 years in the field of Christian apologetics. I've been president of OCA, the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. And the main focus of my ministry has been evangelism, and apologetics, um, I guess, engaging with the, the questions and objections that, that, that people outside of the church have. And as was said in that introduction, doing that in secular spaces, in spaces where, um, where people work and think and um, aren't necessarily sort of particularly church orientated. And I think we can all agree that there's a huge need for us as a church to continue to and to really press into reaching highly educated and influential people in Europe. Um, my own background is that my um, my father is is German, born in Germany um, during the war, and my grandparents and my grandfather was a um, a research scientist, and they ended up. Um, escaping from East, East Germany after Russian occupation and coming to live in the UK. But my grandfather was a, a very committed atheist and raised the family as, as atheists and forbade the reading of the Bible. There was just no God talk at all. My dad went on to become an academic himself. He, he had um, teaching positions in various universities and it was only in his mid 30s that he began to really kind of question um, his life and question meaning and purpose and all those big questions and a colleague um, at the university took him along to a lunchtime talk where he heard somebody speaking about the resurrection of Jesus and it was really the first time he'd heard um, anything even grouping um, faith or God existing together with categories of truth. He, he thought that was a category mistake to say, you know, there's, there's evidence or this is something we should think about because to him religion was purely in the sort of personal, psychological or cultural sphere and wasn't part of his personal psychological or, or cultural experience. So it was irrelevant. And that really began, um, that began a sort of faith adventure for him. He, he was very dramatically converted in his mid thirties and then ended up um, 
becoming involved in evangelism and church planting um, in his later career. So my mum also became a Christian and my sister and I. So, um, so our background as a family has been that God really intervened um, in our lives. And um, my grandmother became a Christian in her in her 70s, which was really, really glorious. So, so God intervened in that way for us. And so um, it's something that I feel very deeply and strongly about um, that need to, to reach out to people who may seem to have everything materially or may seem to have you know, fulfillment in career or whatever, but, but they don't know the Lord and they headed for a destiny um, eternally without him. So what are some, some principles and some thoughts that um, might be helpful as we think about how we go about reaching and building churches that reach um, educated people in Europe. I think the first thing I'd want to say is that we could do a lot by supporting evangelicals who want to do this and who feel like they are actually called into culture making careers. And we can do that by creating church and ministry contexts that don't present um, working for full time in, in Christian work as superior spiritually in some way. So we can make efforts to affirm the calling of those who are, are in workplaces and in culture making careers and perhaps we can preach on this, perhaps we can profile in our churches and movements um, evangelical Christians who are bankers and lawyers and professors and research scientists and doctors. Um, we can be aware of, of a tendency towards anti-intellectualism perhaps in our circles and we can challenge it when we hear it. So this is something that um, I've tried to do even in one of the youth movement things I'm involved in leading, which is a sort of youth apologetics uh, movement called Reboot. And we've tried to um, expose Christian young people, not just to apologetics done by professional apologists or by lecturers and professors in universities, but also for them to hear from, you know, doctors who are working on the front line in medicine and, who, who are Christians, but who are modeling living for Christ in, in, in that sort of context. So we know that all truth is God's truth. We know that 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and onwards reminds us that there are different parts of the body and we all need to play our part. But do we really believe that believers in their workplaces are actually on the front line? And do we understand that they can sometimes feel a bit demoralised by us who are full time Christian workers? They they can imagine that, you know, we are the sort of super spiritual ones who are really doing the heavy lifting for the kingdom and they're somehow on the sidelines. I spoke recently to a Christian journalist who works in a high position for a very well-known international news publication. He has a senior role writing and editing. He's a passionate follower of Jesus. And what he writes in his work is read by hundreds of thousands of people, most weeks, if not millions. But he shared with me that he has lived for more than 20 years since he became, became a Christian. He's lived with a feeling that maybe he is less than or maybe he's not doing quite enough for God because he didn't become a pastor because he's not in full time Christian ministry. So um, even even people that appear to be, you know, very strong Christians on the absolute front line of of in culture making careers can live under under that 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 feeling of of not really being supported by the church so support evangelicals who want to think and who feel called into culture making careers um, secondly and more briefly the need for apologetics um, so how are we going to reach highly educated people in europe well we're going to need to be doing evangelism that is also undergirded by apologetics because the reality is that as nominalism grows, as um, 
you know, as people are increasingly far, far, far away from the church, they're going to have questions and objections. There may be vast areas of knowledge that they just don't have about the gospel. So it may not be that they're actually rejecting Christianity. They just don't know anything about it. And so um, the way that we do evangelism um, needs to engage with, with hearts as well as minds. Um, so engage with, with people's real questions and profound objections. And I think that's true in our frontline evangelism. And it's also true in our discipleship of believers, because if um, believers are going to have confidence to speak one to one to friends evangelistically, they're going to be made needing to be prepared to cope with the questions and objections that they'll face in those conversations. So there's a massive need for apologetics. And I think there's also potentially more of a kind of um, strategic evangelistic effort that we could make to reach young people whilst they're at university in Europe, while they're still young, before they go on to become highly, highly educated people, make sure that we've got fire-filled, passionate, but intelligent and undergirded by apologetics evangelism happening in all of those top universities in Europe. Um, IFES, of course, is a very significant movement and um, really doing that and doing mission weeks and all of that. Um, but, but that's probably a, a, a real emphasis that we need to think about. And then thirdly, we might ask the question, how do we find people who are going to have that capacity for building the kingdom amongst highly educated people? And I believe that we may need to intentionally create a pipeline um, to do this, that it's not going to happen by accident. And that might mean starting by looking for and identifying people who are already senior in, um, in workplaces across Europe that are culture making, whether that's in um, research science or in medicine or in law or in academia or journalism or engineering. Perhaps we might want to identify some of those streams or in media more widely. And um, can we identify key Christians who are working in those spaces and then work with them to create and support networks of younger Christians coming into those workplaces? So a Christian network or, or fellowship in those spheres, perhaps in even in specific companies. So an example that I could give you um, is that a, a number of us were involved in a mission in, in East London in 2016 as part of Oxford, the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. And um, there was a, a person who was involved, and this is a, a kind of poorer area of London, but it's right on the border of, of the kind of more businessy area, Canary Wharf, and, and um, you know, East London sort of goes right into, into the city. And so um, one of our team was um, made contact with a, a young guy who just started working at Goldman Sachs, the bank. And um, this, this young person felt inspired and encouraged to, to gather a, a kind of Christian network in the bank. And there were about 15 people who came from the bank um, to that Christian network, which met regularly in the workplace. Then um, a number of us were, were invited back and began to talk about a longer strategy with this group about how to think about sharing faith in that bank and also kind of growing the Christian presence. And that led to a four part series across 2017 and 2018 of four evangelistic events hosted in the bank. So in the boardroom or one of the conferences conference rooms of the bank and people invited to come and as a result of that the network grew to um, have often 40 to 50 people in attendance and that led them to restructure their network um, and to, to hand over really to the younger people who had a lot of energy and now there are over a hundred people in, in that network who come to, to different events that they put on and they have regular evangelistic events in the bank at lunchtime or sort of that early evening networking time while people are still at work, not expecting people to go to an um, evangelistic event in a church, but doing it there 
Um, and then that network in that particular bank was able to coach other fledgling networks in emerging banks across London and, and other companies. So regular prayer and Bible study and then outreach happening in those places. So let's build a pipeline. And then lastly, with one, sorry, I'm just going to take 30 seconds more and then open it up for questions. Um, lastly, evangelism needs to happen in the same way that it happens in the New Testament, by proclamation in small groups and by um, relational evangelism one to one. And that's, that's true with highly educated people in Europe as much as it is with the, with the Roma people or whoever else we're trying to reach. So think creatively about proclamation evangelism in those kinds of settings. Um, we developed a, a ministry called Festival of Thought, which was effectively a, a mission week in kind of corporate centres of, of influence like Zurich or like um, Canary Wolf in London. We've done it in Singapore and in, in South Africa as well, where we'd have a crescendo of evangelistic events in banks, law firms, um, across insurance firms at, at lunch times and early evening across a week, but coming together as a sort of concert of evangelism um, or, or Christmas events or whatever it is, but doing it in people's workplaces where they're working so that we don't wait for people to come to us. So evangelism still needs to happen um, by proclamation and relationally. We need to try and create um, a pipeline of younger people who are going to be able to, to reach out in this kind of kingdom orientated way amongst highly educated people. Um, we need to focus on apologetics, both out there in our evangelism, but also in the church, building confidence of believers. And, um, and we need to support evangelicals who feel that calling into culture making and remind them and encourage them and contend for them that their calling is not less than full time Christian work, that they are truly on the front line and that um, they can build the kingdom where they are. So thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. For your insights and um, just for your information why do you see me i'm taking over um for this q a from connie who is a little bit pressured with uh, the situation um that she just uh, shared um so um yeah let's keep her in our uh, prayers for the moment and uh, but we thank you amy um for the points you've shared and indeed, please uh, feel free to share your um, questions in the chat, um, to put them directly into the chat box and I'll read some of them out um, and um, direct them to you, Amy. So um, Ari de Pater uh, was, uh, was the first one to um, put a question in the chat. Eventually, there's no way to scientifically prove Christianity. So how to get through or around that scientism and get to the hearts of those totally emerged in a scientific mindset. In the end, Christianity is about a relation rather than about knowledge and proof. Ari, that was rather a statement, um, but we are turning it into a question. Okay. Uh, for you, Amy, is 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 that true? Would you would you agree? So, um, well, I would want to be quite careful with the word prove. Um, obviously, that 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 word prove can have different meanings. Um, and within a kind of scientific framework, there are a very, very limited number of things that can be proven in a kind of repeatable scientific experiment. Yet scientists actually operate with, um, with theories and worldviews um, and intuitions as, as much as the rest of us do and often make decisions based on evidence rather than proof. And so, um, a great way to, to reach people who are kind of in that sort of scientific mindset um, is to support the efforts of, of scientists who are doing that. So I think, I just think of two um, friends and colleagues of mine here in the UK. One um, is Professor John Lennox, who was Professor of Maths here at Oxford for years. He's um, he's done a lot of work in the, in this space, so that he's a person we can learn from. Or Professor Ard Lewy, Professor of Theoretical Physics here at Oxford, um, 
who speaks into this really, really powerfully and um, was asked this question at, at Reboot, that youth apologetics conference um, and movement that I was telling you about. And he shared that there are many, many phys physicists in the department here who aren't just believers in God, but who are, you know, passionate, passionate Christians. So um, creating contexts where Christians can flourish in that scientific field and then actually reach their own colleagues. They can do that way better than better than I can, but it's helpful for us as as, as ordinary believers to, to be aware of those efforts. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now um, questions are coming in and that's great. Uh, so um, I'm going to take it to Linda now who wrote, I worry about the cancel culture that seems to be growing on universities, canceling divergent worldviews and making it hard to be Christian witnesses in academia. Mm. Do you share this and how can we deal with it? Amy? Yeah, that's, um, that's a, 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 a really powerful and profound question. And it's certainly something that um, lots of the Christian academics that I know really struggle with. And I think is an area where um, they need to feel we <laughs> have their back as the church, like the, that we care about what's happening there and that we pray for them because that kind of council culture that may start in universities will eventually sort of filter down into wider public life. And we, we already see that happening. So I think a couple of, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one would be that we need to make sure that if we're going to be cancelled, it's for good reasons and not stupid reasons. <laughs> so we need to make sure that um, the, the way that we're presenting the truth of the gospel and the way that we are responding to the ethical issues of our day are not objectionable because of the tone or the mode or even the phrasing, but that it's actually the content of what, you know, the Bible teaches. Um, and, and so a great deal of care needs to be taken there around communication. I think the second thing that, that we can say is that often there are atheist groups that can be our allies and we need to make sure that we are also allies of free speech, even when we don't agree with the, with the speech. Um, so we're not participating in council culture when it suits us. Um, so, uh, for example, in a lot of the debates now around what it means to be human, about whether biological sex exists or whether gender is just in the mind, these are some of the issues that people have begun to be cancelled over. It's fascinating that, to me, that um, a person like Richard Dawkins has just been cancelled for saying biological sex exists. And that um, some of the people sort of at the forefront of contending for um, biological sex as a category, womanhood actually existing, are your kind of hard left, hardcore feminists who are often also atheists, but they are really our allies. And, you know, I, I've um, been in touch with, with some quite senior um, feminists in the English speaking world who um, wouldn't be anywhere near describing themselves as Christians, certainly not, but who are bearing the brunt on this issue. And they're asking me, where is the church? Where are you? You are needed um, in, in, in this conversation. So um, I, I think there's probably quite a lot to be done relationally with with groups of people who care about free speech and um, who might be surprised when they get to know us and meet us that we're not these hideous, objectionable religious fundamentalists. And there's probably a gospel opportunity there in that relationship building too. Where is the church? Uh, um, that was what uh, Amy's... Uh, um person she talked to uh, asked as a question they, they were actually to excuse my language but actually like where the hell are you where yeah. is the church yeah <laughs> so we, we need the real talk here indeed yeah. 
Uh, I think that connects quite well to Jirshi's uh, question. I see very, uh, and it deals with capacity, and maybe that's uh, also what you pointed to when you talked about the pipeline we need to build. I see very few churches in our country, and he's uh, coming from Czech Republic, that would be able to create space where students and people from the ac academy could discuss difficult issues and really integrate their faith with their fields of study mm -hmm. or deal with questions that secular acad academy uh, academia rises, uh, raises. So I think that really deals with uh, the capacity we have in the church um, to uh, deal with these uh, tricky questions and um, with with people who, who bring a lot of these questions. And like you said, uh, do not increasingly do not have the background of uh, sort of a spiritual um, upbringing and education like we've mm -hmm. uh, we've had it in previous generations, maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a really poignant question. And I guess you, you would be a better place to answer it than me. I mean, just a, a couple of thoughts that I, I would um, I would want to share, I think, is that it doesn't need to necessarily be every single church that um, is doing this. It can't be something that is obviously the focus of every single Sunday. But that doesn't mean we can't do it at all. And um, so I guess what I would ask would be, could, would, would it be possible to maybe create some kind of national conference or even just one day in the year where some of those conversations could, could start and you could kind of gather maybe um, international, uh, either apologists or academics who would make themselves available for something like that for a day. Um, and then I guess mentor in-house in country groups that, that could continue on from that. Um, and I personally think we need to start this for, for teenagers. I mean, that, that I've got three teenagers myself and um, the, these kinds of questions are, are thrown at young people who are Christians by 12. Sometimes it's too late to sort of start when they're 21. You know, we need to really, to really start young. So, um, yeah, that's just a couple of thoughts. And, and to stay with this, um, starting young, Harry asked, uh, are you aware, maybe you have a hint for us here, of partnerships to develop apologetic resources, especially for families and children, and resources to help youth see how they can be fully serving God as mm -hmm. kingdom ambassadors, even in every sphere of society? Is there yeah, anything sure. you know? Um, so that you could have a look at rebootglobal.org. That's the website that um, has sort of hosted global youth apologetics. And there's lots of short videos there that are um, answers to, to, to questions that young people around the world have, have, um, have asked. Or um, Rebecca McCulloch has just written a book. Um, she wrote Confident Christianity, but she's just written a book for teenagers apologetics for for um for teenagers and that's really a really fantastic resource that's quite new so i'd really recommend that great thank you and there are so so i put rebootglobal.com into the i think it's dot org actually sorry dot org oh okay all right so it's yeah just just change the yeah. uh, top level domain there in the end um there are further resources in the in the chat. Julia, thankfully, uh, posted um, two websites uh, where you can find other resources. And um, yeah, I think that also speaks to Mark's um, question from Switzerland. How can we as EAs, um, so National Evangelical Alliances, support ministries like yours and um, get uh, get this going? I think you you were talking to these national conferences um, as an idea. Um, and I think uh, that uh, is also a place, and Reinhardt uh, put that into the chat, uh, where we can translate uh, what we mean by hope into mm. different uh, settings in the, in the marketplace or in the workplace. Uh, so also here we have the challenge to sort of move away from our can canonetic uh, language uh, into the language uh, banks understand, uh, yeah. academia understands. So... I'm just trying to summarize a little bit what uh, what came in in uh, in the chat. Um, we have actually reached the end of our time, but if there anything else, uh, Amy, you 
uh, feel the need to to share um want to give you the last word in this session oh, thank you um i think just that yeah the last thing i would share is that that um people are still people even if they're highly educated and um they still desperately need the lord and I've been constantly surprised in the last three or four years as I've had opportunities to go into banks and law firms and consultancy firms and just have felt quite a liberty to really go for it, you know, using apologetics, but to really um, share the gospel and the blessing of seeing people come to know Jesus there and then um, and begin to follow him. And um, I guess, I sense, I sense it here um, in the UK and even, um, you know, what, in conversations around the world that it, in this sort of post-pandemic moment that perhaps lots of us are feeling quite weary and we're feeling perhaps a bit on the back foot, but just to remind ourselves that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who will believe. And that is true in parliaments, in businesses, in universities, as much as it is in, on the street and over the garden fence. And so, you know, let's let's be confident to, to step out for him. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you for your time. Uh, you have been a blessing uh, to this conference and a very inspirational uh, voice. Uh, we thank you for that. We bless you for your further uh, work and, and um, ministry and uh, yeah let's stay in touch um, I would say it's so uh, so much needed um, to work across all these uh, different uh, dimensions and at this point I'm giving it uh, back to um, Connie for the wrap-up of the day. Mm -hmm.